I'm sure you're aware, is pretty wide. So it's difficult to talk about any particular one, but I've chosen to pick on HL7 because it's the one that's the most prevalent in healthcare. So just to get a feel for the audience, how many of you guys have your hands? How many of you guys are kind of hardcore coders? Who's run the codes? Cool, okay. And how many are sort of from a clinical background? Cool, awesome. Okay, and who's none of those things? Okay, that's going to be good. I'm not sure what you guys are doing, but. Cool, okay. So I'm going to talk about HL7 quite a bit. Um, there's going to be a, it's going to talk quite a bit about, about how HL7 is composed, so it is a little bit techy. Um, hopefully I'll keep a clinical basis with it, so hopefully you can see why HL7 is used as a format. Um, so for people who are non-techy, you probably, this is probably the biggest transparency, you probably wouldn't know, to be honest. But it's what HL7 is trying to achieve, um, that's kind of important. So, oops. So by way of agenda, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a little bit about, give you a bit of background first, then I'm going to talk about HL7, then I'm going to talk about the versions of HL7, um, which there are a few. Uh, for the techies, the last one is probably quite exciting, I'm excited. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty good. Then the challenges, so the challenges in healthcare, that's, that's really important. This, is, this stuff's really important because it's, it's all great. I'm going to paint a really good picture for you, but there are some distinct challenges. And I'm going to give you some of my advice about how you can overcome those challenges. Then, obviously, questions at the end. So if you wouldn't mind, just leave your questions at the end, make a note, and then ask me at the end. Um, only because we've got quite, I've got quite a bit to get through. So, um, unless it's burning more than anything. Okay. So, just a little bit of introduction about who I am, just so you've got a sort of idea of who I am and why I'm here. So, what I do is I have us linked. Um, I actually look after Havas Health Software, which is actually part of Havas Links Group. Uh, what Havas Health Software do is a little bit different to the rest of the agency. We are, we're a digital marketing agency, but what Havas Health Software do is is a bit different in that we we both do software as a service, but then we also do we build. Um, build healthcare solutions for our customers as well. I'll come on to it there in a minute. Um, so I've been in the industry for 18 years, there or thereabouts. Um, as was mentioned, my background is actually in the, in the, it's pretty varied. I've come from a financial banking and insurance background. Um, as was mentioned, I've worked in healthcare for about four years. Uh, I'm an author and a writer. Uh, and I'm also, uh, we're also, I'm also a member of the HL7 UK Charter as well. Um, so, yeah. Bit about me. Okay, so how us links? So these are the people that we, these are some of the people that we work with, um, some pretty major pharmaceutical folks up there. Uh, who here thinks that pharmaceutical companies don't work in healthcare? Just, just sell drugs. Who thinks that? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's so that it's a it's it's a fair distinction and. Um, I would encourage you to read the booklets there in front of you, give you a bit of flavour about what we've been to as of late and our views on things. I do encourage you to read, read them because it's good for you. Um, previously, what I myself software do with these, these folks is actually work with, we work with their innovation groups. So what we do is help them, these, these guys innovate in healthcare and build new solutions to work with healthcare institutions. So in terms of the greater agency, agency so the greater Havas agency, uh, we work with people like people like these folks. So we work with Microsoft and Facebook and Apple and all those folks. Um, so we, we the company we keep is pretty rich. We do quite a bit. Um, in terms of hospitals as well, so I feel I always think this one's pretty important. Uh, this goes back to about February of this year, so um, I'm not going all the way back. But in terms of who we've worked, who we've worked with, the systems we've built are, are now in place in some of these places. So. Uh, so we're, we're working with guys in St Thomas and Central London, uh, <coughs> Healthcare Trust, um, just outside of London, Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, and also uh, the South End CCG as well. Um, so we've built we've built systems for all these guys in use by these guys. Okie doke. So today we're exchange in healthcare is what I'm really going to talk about today. So it's pretty it's a pretty challenging thing that to data exchange in healthcare. Got lots of different systems. You've got one for managing patients, you've got one for managing appointments, you've got one for managing uh, more clinical information, x-rays, that sort of thing. You've got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different systems in hospital. 
usually done by different vendors as well. Um, so all of them are all sort of, they're all there, all trying to do the same job. And the vision in healthcare was always about how can I get all of these things to play with each other? How can I share information across them? And within the NHS, or within a hospital, within their boundaries, it's pretty simple actually. It kind of, it kind of works to a degree. Outside of their boundaries, it gets a, it gets a lot more difficult. But what HL7 is kind of there for is to help that interchange of information. So, if you imagine all these different systems, how we get, how can we share information? How can my, how can a doctor see patient records that's been done by someplace else? That's the challenge of HL7. So, oops. So HL7. Uh, who here has heard of HL7? Okay, cool. Who has worked with HL7? Cool. So you guys, are, you guys will be able to uh, make us talk. It's great. So um, who's worked with? Which out of interest, which version of HL7 you worked with? Three. Version three was just fine. Okay, have you worked with two? Hmm? Have you worked with version two? I know enough about it, I don't want to work with it. Okay, okay, <laughs> don't blame me. Okay, so HL7, HL7 uh, <coughs> it, it's a funny name because it's both a data format, but also organisation and also a standard. So HL7 International is the body which looks after HL7. It's a standards body, it calls itself a standards body, but it's kind of really not a standards body. Uh, not in the same sense as, say, say ISA, for example. Uh, but what it is, 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 a, is an organisation which controls what HL7 as a data exchange format is and what it looks like and what it does. So what HL7 as an organisation also does, <coughs> it brings in lots of folks to work within the HL7 organisation. And it's come, from, it's come from a range of healthcare backgrounds um, and technology backgrounds as well to help build these standards. Um, what they also do is partition themselves up into working groups. So you've got certain groups which look after certain areas of the, of the specification and standard, um, and they're formed by different members. Uh, so really what, what HL7 as, a, as, a, as, a, as an entity, as a data exchange format, it's very common to find it in healthcare IT systems. So it's very common to find it in the NHS, it's, it's pretty old, it's pretty, 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 pretty relevant. Um, and organisations elsewhere. It's used in approximately 35 countries around the world, and um, given the fact that it was first found in 1987, you know, its prevalence is growing and growing and growing. Um, so, I'll talk about version 2. So, sometimes people ask me what happened to version 1, I don't know if anyone knows that story. Uh, so, version 1 and version 2 actually were, were quite poor. Uh, they were so bad that nobody used them, nobody cared. Uh, and it was only really until about 2.1 was drafted that people started to adopt it and make use of it. So it was about 91 when this happened. Uh, and since then, what's happened is, is the, the, two, the version 2 of the standard has grown quite a bit. So it's up to now, it's about 2.7 now. Uh, it's, it's in use in, in lots of countries around the world. In the NHS, um, in my experience, I'm only basing this on my own experience, it's very common to see 2.1 or 2.5. I'm pretty sure you, those that have used it will probably have seen fuller versions of the flavours of it. Um, but it's pretty common to see 2.1 to 2.5. Who knows why that's the case? Who can guess why that would be the case? Anybody? It's common because the vendors were back in about 2005, so when, when the NHS went through and kind of went through their failed IT projects, put lots of vendors in to put their system, put their APR systems and things in. At the time, the version of HL7 that was in use was was stuck in this range, so that's why it's common to see they, they kind of got it now and they're living with it. So in the NHS, you're very commonly going to see the two, version two standard. You want to see version three? Um, if you do, it's pretty it is quite a rare thing. Um, so in terms of what version two looks after, you've got things such as patient demographics, clinical observations. Scheduling the patient appointment resources, it covers, it covers quite a range of clinical needs and requirements. So now I'm going to talk about the, stand, about the structure. So uh, it's pretty, when you look at it, it looks pretty bad. Um, <coughs> even if someone is technical, it, it kind of scrambles your mind a little bit. I think the gentleman there mentioned who doesn't like the look at it, and it's pretty bad. Uh, it's actually based on, uh, it's based on ANSI, and the way that it's structured is kind of simple, kind of not. It kind of makes sense when you look at it. But one of the reasons why it's so complicated to look at and it's, is because it's so easy to transmit. 
So if you can imagine a very old system trying to transmit information around a network, or trying to talk to each other, the easier it is for them, the better. So the way that it's built is that you've got you've got segments and you've got sequences. <coughs> and sequences, and sequences are broken up. Then you've got information within. Each segment has a particular meaning within the message as well. But I'll come on to that. So, uh, so ADTs. Who has who here has heard of ADTs? <laughs> so, uh, it stands for emission discharge and treatment, and it's a categorization basically of HL7 messages. HL7 doesn't limit itself just to to emission discharge and treatment, but they're your main clinical, actually main clinical group. So um, the standard actually goes beyond it, but we, but you'll very commonly, um, if you're working with this, you'll very commonly just see, just see the A group, the T group. So the way that the standard, the way that HL7 organises itself is it numbers things. So you've got some, you've got things like A1, which is an emit, A2, and A2, which is transfer, pre-emit, so on and so forth. Um, it goes on to 62, so it's covering quite a lot of clinical needs, clinical requirements, things that a, a clinical system is going to do. Um, as well, in terms of a sequence, uh, it, can, it can work in a sequence. So you've got, for example, you've got, I've got a registration, then I've got a pre-admission, then I've got an admission, then I've got a transfer, then I've got a cancel transfer, then I've got another transfer, and then I've finally got a discharge. So you've got that flow of messages. And HL7 is intended to model the clinical process as well. So it's really the software itself which is which is orchestrating the process, but from a clinical basis, you want it to you want it to flow the the same way as your information, the same way as you would do things on a clinical basis. And the standard the standard is built for that. Okay. So moving on to what segments are. So every message Every message I talked about, A185, they all have segments in them. And segments vary a little bit. So you may, for example, and this is just an example, you will you all have a header, they all have headers. You'll have an event type, you'll have a patient identification, and also your patient vision. So you so you'll have different segments, they're not all present, the header is there. In terms of a of a patient identification segment. What you'll have is different fields. Now, this is a sample, I've not included all of them. So you'll have, uh, you'll start with the set ID, work its way down to for date of birth, and then it keeps going. Um, they're not all required, some are required, some are not, and there's different lengths as well. There are also data types as well, which I've chosen not to talk about today uh, because it's a very big subject <coughs> and it will take me hours. So I encourage you to encourage you to do your research about types. Um, because it does have its own typing system, which is a bit, a bit fruity. Okay, uh, so an example, and this is where it's all going to go wrong. Um, I'm going to go wrong on this. Okay, cool. So, uh, so the tool I'm actually using here is a commercial tool. Uh, there's a few there's a few editors you can use, but uh, but seven edit is seven edit is quite nice. Um, so yeah, you have, to, you have to pay money for this one. But it's kind of it does kind of it is quite nice because it does break down the message quite well. So over here, what we've got is your actual message. So there's, so there's my header, there's my event, there's my visit, and there's my patient identification. So then I've got my delimited fields that I've talked about, and then I've got actual bits of information within them as well. This one over here is actually your message identifier, and then you've got a bit more, a bit more information. What's nice about this tool as well is it actually breaks it down for you, so I can actually see, as you can see, what it actually includes. So this is everything that should be in the message, and this is what's actually here. So as you can see it, um, so you can see it's got a patient ID and all the rest of it. So this is a nice visualization of this. So it does help actually. Uh, very common though, when you when you're looking at some of these, looking at some of these messages, you'll just have to. You'll probably just have to work it out yourself um, what's in there, but like I say, it's it's quite a difficult format to get your head around. Would you agree? Okay. So, okay. Cool. 
Okay, so that's version two in a flash. Now I'm going to talk about version three because this is going to take me a little bit while longer. So who's who's seen version three? Who used version three? Cool. Okay, I'm not going to talk about types today, so I'm going to omit that bit. I am going to talk about the way that V3 is broken up. It's a big thing. It's a very big thing. Uh, the spec is on disk is about 1.2 gig in size, including images and stuff. So it's pretty massive. Um, version 3 is, is version 3 is an interesting beast because version 3 was started in about 2005, and it really was it was done because people felt HL7 felt that the version 2 was pretty complicated, wasn't that flexible, um, didn't give people the power it needed, and they needed to evolve it somewhat, make it a bit more modern. So, what they chose to do is create version 3 based on XML. Now, what version what version 3 gave them was was more schema, more structure. It also gives them extension as well. So that meant that you could you could both use the standard as is, but you could also create your own definitions as well, which is great. Technically you could do that with version two, but it wasn't quite the same. So the great thing about the great thing about version three is it's pretty modern and really the spec in particular uses this word, which is semantic interoperability. Well, basically, what it means is that I can I can share my information around, and my system, all my systems should understand the same bits of information that are flowing around. There should be no variances. There should be no misunderstandings. It's going it is going to work because it's it's all rich and nice. Okay. So, what version three? What version three starts with as a basis is something called something called something called RIM. I'll move on to what the CFC is in a minute. But what what RIM is is a primary object model. So it kind of what it does is is it really gives you the ability to break down all the things. So I can I can say it's for medical records or laboratory, or I can say it's for pharmacy or accounting and billing. It's just it gives me all these things, but I can also say it's for something else as well. And really, kind of the way that it's broken up as well is that I've got I've got for each and every domain. So I've got my I've got different domains, and these different domains could be pharmaceutical domain, could be a laboratory domain, could be a patient registration, patient domain, it could be any one of these kinds of different kinds of domains. And what what we have within there, and the way that the specification is broken up is it is that it describes it's very it's very uh, for the text here, it's very it's very rational rows, it's very uh, it's very uh, thorough, let's say. Uh, and what it gives me is it gives me storyboards, trigger events, it gives me lots of information about how this about how this domain is particularly broken up and all the information, how these events work and how it all flows and works. And it all sounds great. And it's huge. So there's my this, so there's my uh, there's my reference model. This is the basis of version three, this is how it all this is how the reference model works for everybody. And what this, what's kind of interesting about this is that it actually started life and it was a lot, lot bigger. Like a lot bigger. Um, I think there was something like 50 uh, objects that it started. Um, but it's been refined and uh, and HL7 are going down to what now looks like this. To so look at it, it looks pretty frightening, but really it's kind of, it is quite simple. The way that it's, it's color coded for a reason, the color codes kind of do mean something. So you've got an action, I've got a, I've got a participant, I've got a relationship with an act. I've got a role and I've got an entity. So if I kind of explain that a little bit more, what I've got is, uh, so it's an act, procedure, it's participating, so it's a record target. Uh, I've got a surgeon as my performer, and he's acting on a patient, and the, what, we, what the patient's going to be represented by as a person. So the model kind of represents this kind of flow and represents kind of what's going to go on, but that's what's happening is it's going on in the domain. It just, this just gives us the information that we need to do that. Okay. So then, what kind of what the way that the domains themselves all work? So lab, uh, patient, all those. The way that they're broken down is we have a refinement. So what we have is we have it starts life with a domain message. That may have a refined message that then kind of hangs off it. Uh, what the domain message does is, is it gives us a, it gives us a, 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 a something that's a bit more specific to our particular domain, so it could be to a laboratory. But then we have a refined message that then goes off it, so it could be in my laboratory I'm going to do something, a certain action, so something's going to happen there. So but sometimes, some of the domains you don't, sometimes in the specification, you don't always see 
domain model, but sometimes you just see the reference models. Um, it depends on depends on how it's been done. But the point, the really, what we're after really is that is there a final message. So, what a so for example, patient administration. So this has come from the standard. Uh, what you've got here is you've got the domain model for our patient administration. The colours do mean something, but again, it's going to be outside the script as to describe where it all ha it hangs together and how it all works. Uh, just take it from me, it's pretty big. But then what uh, that hangs off it is an active patient. So really, what I've got is, what started life with something that looks like that, then it comes to this, which looks worse, but then eventually we get to that, which is kind of what we're after. So my active patient, and this is, this is what this is talking about, is each one of these is bits of information that I want to communicate. So when I want to communicate and activate a patient message, and I want to send that message out, my, my computer system has done this. It then fires that out, another system picks it up. It needs, the other system kind of is a bit ignorant of kind of, well, to a degree, it's going to be a bit ignorant of what this other system is talking about. It doesn't know. So it kind of needs to know what objects. It's a bit like, I suppose it's a bit like uh, talking to someone, I don't know. I don't know, in code, but then not giving them a code book. So, I'm not clear what I'm talking about. So, the two systems need to know kind of what the other system is talking about and what, inf what bits of information it's, is, re is relevant to me. So, what's happened is, is that each, each within HL7 organization, a particular group of people have worked on this particular domain and they've come up in the standard, and this is all written down. All of this stuff, all of this information, they've documented everything about how this all hangs together. So as implementers, you can implement all of these things. Okay, so wrappers. So what wrappers do is, is in terms of I want to send my information out, and what a wrapper does is, is wraps up this, inf this block of information in something that kind of is a bit more meaningful. I'm just going to explain them a bit more. So what I've got is, I've got a transmission wrapper. So what the transmission wrapper does is gives us a bit more information around that block of information. It sort of sits above it, so it gives me a data time, a sender receiver, and it also says acknowledge when you send this as well, so it gives me an acknowledgement. Uh, what it then does is it sort of wraps around the control act and the payload. I'll go come up to them now. So what a control act is, is, is it sort of gives us a bit more of an interaction about that message as well, and it's broken down a bit more, so we've got the message control act, We've got query infrastructure and the master file registry as well. What's kind of relevant here is that domain messages have different uses for this as well. It's not in the standards a bit a bit flaky there. Um, but what this is basically saying is is that when I've I'm going I've done something, you sent me a message, I've done something, I'm gonna send you a message back saying I've done it and I need to tell you how what I've done, all the rest of it. Okay. So just to just a little bit more as well. So what CMET is CMAP stands for the common message element type, and what, what it does is just gives us a reusable part. For example, uh, patient, you'll often, patient often gets used all over the show. Um, it's kind of, it's really, it's included but then isolated, it's kind of weird in the, uh, include it in there, but then it's sort of isolated from it. And because it's isolated, it does mean that something else that influences that means that it doesn't necessarily going to get used elsewhere. For the implementers in the room, it's a bit of a headache. Um, but it's great because it gives us that flexibility to make the system do what we want. <coughs> uh, so in terms of transports as well, uh, there's three that particularly get used. Uh, so there's the MML, MLLP, those that use version 2, we'll use that a lot, uh, but it's a bit limited, um, it doesn't provide routing and that sort of thing. So it's probably the most common and sits very nice, sits very well with the XML payload, um, but doesn't make the message quite big. The final one is, is EBXML, which is my least favourite. Um, well, the and the, what the standard, it's a seven standard, gives us is a payload specification. So, they're your, for the implementers in the room, they're your options. So, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of a, of a HL73. This is going to be quite quick. Uh, so, hopefully, this will work again. Oh. So, <clears throat> So in terms of how it's broken, I've broken this up into three component parts, just so to give you an idea. What this is is a laboratory observation. So the HL7 standard, um, it has a particular coding notation that it uses. So when it talks about particular messages, it kind of codes them so you actually can have an idea of what it is, 
what one of these you're actually looking at here because it's not it's not immediately obvious. So this one is just a, a it's just one I pulled out from um, for an example. Uh, it's not an actual it's not an actual message um, for obvious reasons. I can't do that. Uh, but the next one, the notation up here is the relevant part. So this this tells us what kind of message it is. Then because this is because this is language observation, it's geared to that. So all of the information that I see in here is geared to that particular this particular event. It's, it's unique to it really. So what I have in here, for example, is I have a I've got my receiver, so I can see actually my receiver bit and then my sender. So I actually can see where can see where it's come from, where it's going, who sent it. So I can see all that bits of information. Then I've got my trigger event as well. So this gives me a bit more information about my trigger event. Then finally, I've got my actual payload. So this is my so this is my actual observation event. So this is all my clinical details is what I'm interested in. So this this one really isn't hasn't really got any clinical information, but it tells me it does tell me kind of who sent it and who's receiving it because I need to know. And then this gives me a bit more information about the actual event, so it gives me a bit more information about kind of what's happening here. Then I actually got my actual observation. So a few bits and pieces in here that's kind of important is, for example, is I've got my assigned person. So this is my doctor. Uh, that's a surname, which is so why you uh, Then I've got my actual patient here as well. And then at the top is a bit more of my actual information that I'm after. So a bit more of my clinical information. So it expresses it quite well. It's pretty informative. Reads quite well. Kind of, it's all it's all things XML should be in that you'd agree it reads a lot better than the last one. Makes a bit more sense. Don't really need a posh editor to look at it. So if I okay, so. <coughs> Next thing I'm going to talk about is the clinical data document architecture. Who's, who knows this one? Who's ever seen this? Okay. So uh, the so the CDA is uh, CDA is probably the most common of the Hedgehog three version three standards. Um, it's the one of uh, it's the one thing from version three that will probably live on. I think there's a great deal of stuff that won't live on, but. But I think CDA will live on, and the reason why is because it intends to make it's built on the reference information model, just like the rest of version three is. But what it's there for really is to make things a bit more sort of obvious about a clinical document. So, for example, it gives me a it gives me a clinical document, it gives me a header, it gives me a body. It it's giving me all the information I need to express a particular document. For example, a discharge somewhere. So what the, the way that the header works is, is for example, it gives me an ID, it gives me a relationship to a document, it gives me an encounter, so I want to know where this, where this actual clinical document happened and who, who did what with this document, who did what to the particular person. So that's, that's described in my actors, and then the targets themselves. So who's, so who was, who's this document for? Is it for a patient? Is it for their family? Is, who's it for? So then I've got the body itself, and the body. So the interesting thing about the body is the body has no has no structure really. Uh, it gives me additional structures. It gives me sections, paragraphs, lists, and tables. It lets me express a particular document. I can take a clinical document and express it in an, in an electronic form, in a CDA form, and I can share. I can send that to a system that understands clinical data, document architecture, and it will then represent that document in its system. That's the beauty of that's the beauty of doing this. Okay. So what CCR does, which stands for the clinical record, uh, I think that. Uh, so what the clinical record standard does, this is a kind of different standard. This is uh, it's kind of building on CDA a little bit. Uh, but what the CCR sort of what HL7 recognises is that it's great. I mean, there's great flexibility. And that's really cool. That's really cool. But well, that means that people are doing things. It's great to exchange documents, but then people are doing things differently. So my clinical document is a bit different. So that clinical document then is. Actually, one and the same. So what CCR does is it gives us it gives us some templates to sort of fix the structure, and they're standard templates. So they're just it's intended to create some to ensure that you're kind of complying with a particular way of doing things. Okay. So in terms of HL7 tools, um, there's a few. So from a server perspective, so what what HL7 servers do is is basically help to Transmit HL7 messages around. It's probably as easy as what you're describing them. Um, 
So really, H07 is usually produced by a clinical system, a, for example, some kind of patient record system. But then what, then you, what you then really need is something to help bring all this information together and to do more with it. So all these products do this sort of thing. So there's a few in here. You've got Assemble, Avaya, BizTalk and Merv Connect. In my experience, the two I've seen the most is BizTalk and Merv. Um, we actually use Merv with an Avas. I think it's a pretty cool product and it's open source as well. Um, but it does its job very well. BizTalk is a bit, is a bit huge and heavy. Who's used any of these? Have you used a server product before? Work with us on the kind of end nurse. You work with Murph? Yeah, on the edge of it. I'm aware of it. Cool, cool. Not cool. The angle. cool, yeah, I mean, it's, you'll commonly see these in healthcare institutions, and in my experience, all hospitals. Um, they actually use BizTalk quite a lot. So they often will, they often, for us, or people that see outside of hospitals, when they often aggregate patient information, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk in a minute about why that is. Um, one of the reasons as to why they use this talk and these kind of products is to, is to it's more a filling process. It's more to send us particular information rather than all kinds of information. Um, in terms of editors, I showed you a 7 edit, so uh, that's quite a good one. There's also HL7 Inspector, which is an open source tool, and um, that's kind of that's kind of, that's quite nice. Not a nice 7 edit, but it's it lets you look it lets you do your job and lets you say. So for the implementers in the room, you know, these things are really cool. Okay, so. So now I'm going to talk about FHIR. I'm pretty sure people may not have heard of this. Um, this is so. This is so new. It's uh, it's it's kind of cutting edge almost. Um, so FHIR. I'm really excited by FHIR. I really am. I'm, I mean, the geek in me is terribly, terribly excited about all this. Uh, and the reasons why is because it's a modern standard. It's an open standard. So it's it's something that unlike the rest of HL7. Um, HL7 version 2 and version 3 you have to pay money to see, so uh, you have to be a member of the organisation and pay a lot of money to see the standards. This you don't, this, this is freely accessible, I can, go on the, I can go on the website now and access it and see how the standard is built. Uh, I, can even, I can even download code so I can actually start to implement this myself, it's that open, it's great. It supports really modern standards, so modern web standards, so XML and JSON, thank the Lord. Uh, it's also it's also RESTful as well, which is a really good thing. Uh, mission 3 was built on web services, so I could use web services, so web services, but it comes with its own nuances and warps. Uh, whereas REST is, REST is really great. Uh, it's a working draft, so it is, uh, it's kind of ongoing at the minute. Uh, there's a working process through next year and the year after. I say it's cutting edge, but I already know there are some hospitals in the UK, which I can't name, who are actually looking at this. And implementing this and extending their their, their, um, their systems to do this sort of thing, uh, which is really cool. Uh, that's really really cool. It also means for people, for the guys in the room, the implementers in the room, who want to implement and talk to this kind of technology, it's great because it gives us it gives us far more flexibility and power, which is great for clinicians. Okay, so how does it work? So it's a bit, it's very different. It's very very different. Uh, the way that it's broken up is that what we have is we have we have some resources. So it, they're broken up into sort of well two parts really, and then what you've got then is uh, you've got a bundle. So what you've got is you've got a clinical part, an administrative part. The clinical part is pretty cool. So what you've got up here is you've got things like medication and observation, family history. Then an administrative what I've got here is is a patient, a practitioner, a device, all those things. These two these all times all tied to, together in some way as well. So for example, if I want to see the family history for a patient, I pass my patient to my family history and it gives me that family history. So it kind of works, it works along those lines. So the information is, is drawn together. And what we do is we pass various parts of information into it to, to interrogate it all that more. Well, the way that bundles work as well is that a bundle is, is a search, is for example, I want to search uh, for something. And because I'm searching, let's say I'm searching for a particular patient uh, or for types of patient that may have done something, it's going to give me a few things back. So that's what a bundle is. Does that make sense? Cool. So uh, each one of those as well exposes, exposes and called REST verbs. So I've got 
all my, I've got my key set of the verbs up here, so the verbs are action words. So I've got my posts, I've got to get, put in and delete. Uh, and the bundles then are things like a search or a history that I'll get as well. So what I can do here is I can post, for example, a patient, I can create a patient, I can read a patient, I can update a patient, and if I so choose, I can also delete a patient. Uh, I can also search for a patient and also see a history for a patient. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, in terms of security, so uh, Brigazine is a brand new standard, it's kind of built on very modern, tech, modern uh, security standards. So, for example, I can use I can use HTTPS and SSL, I can do that with V3, but, uh, but the standard lets us do that all the more. I can also use OAuth as well, and the other thing I can use in terms of authorization and access control, uh, these things, obviously, this is patient information security is critical. I can use something called the healthcare classification system. This is, HCS is a, is a, is a different standard within HL7. Um, it's actually been built for use in, being used, built in use for V3, but it's been borrowed. What this system does basically is gives us data segmentation. So if there's only certain patients that I'm allowed to see in my system, so if, uh, patients that belong to my particular, that belong to my particular um, therapy group, for example, and I'm only allowed to see those people. I don't want to see other patients. I can't see those other patients. I can only see my particular patients. So I can classify who, why, what I'm supposed to see, or whatever level I am. And it's going to be a clinical level as well, so if I'm a doctor or a nurse or whoever, there's only bits of information I'm supposed to see. And this is how we this is how the system works. It classifies all this information for us. So if I authorize so once I log in and I'm authorized myself, what happens is the system implements this, knows who I am, and knows what information I'm supposed to see, and that's what it spits out. Audits also is very important. So for example, a security event or a problems, I want to know who's done what to what. And I also want to know when they did it, what time, etc. That's really important. Okay, so, all sounds pretty cool, yeah? All sounds straightforward, to a degree. To a degree. This is where the big book comes. So, I'm going to talk, I've talked about HL7 a lot. Uh, and it all sounds great, so systems that can talk to each other, information that can be shared, uh, clinical information that can be expressed, uh, modern relevant standards to let us do all this, all sounds really cool and awesome. But it's a big book. And this is where, for dental maintenance, this is where life gets difficult. Especially when you're talking with the NHS. Because patient information isn't open, open at all. Within their boundaries, within, within, within the NHS organisation, patient information is freely available. I can, I can move patient information around on the network within the hospital just fine. Once I go outside that network, then I have a problem. So access is limited, the data itself is limited. Storage is impossible, security is absolute. Uh, who knows what HIPAA is? If, uh, is. So, uh, for those that don't know, <coughs> so for those that don't know, it stands for the Health Insurance, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It's a US act, it's an act of, act of law, uh, and basically it's there to protect patient information in the US. Um, we don't have something similar in the UK, but the trusts themselves are all, they're all responsible for protecting their patient information, and they are very, very sensitive about it, as you'd expect. As you'd expect. So, great, we've got, this, we've got this ability to get this information, not so good because we can't. How do we get to it? How do we access it? So, why do you say storage is almost impossible? Why do I say storage? Yeah. I sh sorry? I should have said external storage is almost impossible. Oh. Sorry. I'm talking about... So, so really what I'm talking about here is, is once I go outside the hospital boundaries, yeah. then what? That's, that's for you guys, you know, obviously if you're working within the hospital boundaries, great. But this doesn't really apply, you know, well it does, it does apply to a degree, but not as much. Once we go outside of those boundaries, you know, if I want to have, my, my system wants to, wants to take advantage of HL7 and share patient information, how's that going to work? So, well, there's a few ways. This is so. This is really kind of um, my experience. I'm uh, kind of going to talk to you about about how you can about how it's implemented. You can do this sort of thing. How, from an external basis, you can share patient information. And HL7 lets us do this. And it's for most healthcare institutions, HL7 is the information that you will see in exchange. Um, but it's just information. They're just files. Once you process them at your end. Yeah, you send in the HL7 back, but the, the trick really is what you see. And that's where HL7 itself starts to become 
it lends itself to it quite well. FHIR, as I, as I talked about, has systems to let us do this. But the version 2 of the standard doesn't do this, can't do this, and version 3 can't really do this either. So what happens is there are a lot of hospitals will give you a channel. They will give you a particular channel to share information on. And there will be points. And the most easiest, the most easiest way of doing this is point to point. So my server, their server, and they'll lock together in the whole eternity. Um, but the other thing that will happen as well is that really the two the most important persons to talk about in terms of data security in every NHS trust, this is the NHS, is the Culture Guardian. Who knows this person? Who's ever experienced this person? Cool. Cool. So the Cold the Cold Cold Guardian's job in the NH, in a particular trust is to protect the patient information, that's their job. Um, they're the one their information governance is really their job. So what they will do is they will protect, they will state what information can be transmitted and when and how it's going to be stored and everything else, they have to agree all this. A lot of hospitals and the NHS as well, they all, most of them are compliant with this like particular ISO standard 27001, um, which is an information security management system for a uh, standard. Uh, if you comply with this, you're complying with your, how you're protecting your information, what you're doing with the information, that's the key part, really. Um, they want to know that if they send us that information, what you're going to do with it, how you're going to protect that. And this applies to store. This really applies to storage. If you're using, if you're using a um, a third party to for your store your information. So if you're using a cloud, something in the cloud, using the cloud is using is well, it's impossible. Uh, it's not. It's, it's too open. So really, the kind of the storage providers that you're using, or if you if, if you're posting the information yourself, if you're doing that then you need to comply with this particular standard. They need to know that there's physical access to this to this information. That, you know, it's at that level. I'm not just talking about my server protecting this. They want to know, well, who can access that server and how they're going to get to that server and what happens if that server is in a fire or something or, or what happens when you take backups, what you do with the backups, it's all that. In terms of on the wire as well, uh, obviously I'm, changing, I'm sending information down the wire. I need to know I'm going to, I'm going to protect that information. So, I need to know if I'm going to encrypt that information. So the, the most relevant one is SSL. Uh, the minimum standard is usually 256. Uh, I encourage you to go further. Um, I'll just limit yourself to 256. Uh, as well, the other thing is about protecting the data once it's arrived on the wire on your server. What you will do with that? Uh, you need to protect it actually on the box. Uh, I encourage you to I encourage you to encrypt the storage, not the data. Protect the whole drive, and then you're covered. Um, this applies to HIPAA as well. Uh, a lot of storage, certainly in the US, is both HIPAA and ISA 27001 compliant if you use that particular source. But the relevant question, the most relevant question you'll be asked if you, if you come to talk to a hospital is, and they ask you, are you, are you in terms of data exchange, which you've agreed with Colin Guardian, we're going to say, they're going to ask you, okay, so what are you, how are you going to store this? What are you going to do with it? And that's the kind of, and once, if you can just say, well, I'm using 27001, then you've covered all your bases pretty much. Okay, so a bit more information, how you can get information on HL7. So the HL7 International uh, website is www.hl7.org. <coughs> uh, the UK Charter is, uh, is just UK on the end. Um, there is a book, it's a very, very good book, uh, called The Principles of Health and Trouble Hospitality, HL7 and Snow Med, written by uh, a guy called Tim Burton, who is probably the authority in the UK on HL7. It's probably a, uh, a new world authority, in fact. Um, very knowledgeable guy, which you guys to talk to. Um, his book is worth a read. It's quite a terse book. Uh, it's also quite expensive as well, but it's, it's a good book. Cool. <clears throat> so that was a bit whistle, but any questions? Can you just give an example of a kind of situation you'd actually need to? So maybe. I know that the new fire stuff is for maybe mobile devices and things like that. So have you got a recent example that you might use to do that? Um, so, you're talk, so, okay. so you're talking about fire, which is the so FHIR. So, yeah. so, so it's commonly called fire, so just so, you, just so you're aware of that one. Um, it's, fire's a funny one because it's, the authors encourage you to use it on a mobile basis. Uh, because it's built on, obviously it's built because it's built restful, and it's built using OAuth, so it lends itself quite well to mobile technology. But it doesn't, you don't have to limit yourself to that. 
it's there's kind of a fun they they sort of push you towards that because it's a great use case. But you know you're not limited to that any one use case. You can use it and you can use it for anything really. The standard is pretty much open to let you sort of do that sort of thing. And you could use it on a mobile basis. Um, it's, you, know, you could do that. That's great. Uh, but have, you, have you seen an example of that yet? Or not? Uh, no, so been used in a, in a mobile basis. I haven't seen it yet, no. Um, I've only seen it really, thus far I've only seen Fire being used on assistant to system exchange. So what I've seen it. it. Sorry? What's, it, what's that exchange? Just an example of what's happening. So uh, I've only ever seen an exchange of clinical information between one system and the other. So it's sort of something that is common scenario in a, in a, in a version 2 or version 3 of XMR, of HL7. I've just seen I've seen fire being used on that basis. Um, I haven't seen fire being used on an external basis yet. Um, it's too new, I think. But the opportunities are there, and the standard is you know, brilliant for it. Okay, if the if the version two is still very pre prevalent all, all over the place, so we haven't moved from version two. We're barely getting version three, and people are pushing a third standard. Are they trying to bypass version three? Has it been version three? It's a funny one. It's a funny one. Uh, I think version three, the adoption rate for version three was is, is very low. Uh, HL seven, uh, they admit the fact that HL the version three hasn't had the adoption path they would have liked. That's so the NHS and the spine was pushing version three. There's a few messages I've, I've, I've touched the edge of the spine uh, for social care, and it was all version three, and that's why at the point. Oh, uh, the NHS is enlightened and uh, the spine is going to be version 3. Is it not a, like that? Uh, I think the last day, uh, are you talking about version 2 of the spine? Uh, the version of the spine five years ago. Uh, yeah. It was so, XML. I've never, I, I know of the version 2 as a. Yeah, uh, so version, yeah, version 2. So the spine does use, does use version 3 right there. Um, it, it does get used. Um, for that basis, it's a good use case of version 3, but HL7 felt that it wasn't really, it's, you know, it's great to be used in the NHS, but in the greater healthcare sphere, it's just not getting the adoption path they would have liked. Um, so they're moving on to the FHI, is that being pushed by HL7 itself? Or is it uh, yes, it is. So, so FHI is being version developed. Four? So it's been uh, it's version, yeah, version, version 3. Uh, so FHI is being developed by an internal HL7 working group. But they are keeping things open, so you can access the standard and see it. It's not open source, though, so um, you know it's not it isn't quite that open. But they are keeping things pretty open for people to see kind of how the standard is developing. And then, as I mentioned, what they what they're going to do is they're going to have a two-year plan to see how that adoption path rolls. So they're going to start working with various people to see to develop the standard and, and then see how that adoption path goes. Rather than launch, rather than develop a whole standard and then just fire it out, which they did pretty much with version three, to be honest, um, they just felt that version two wasn't enough, so they developed version three, and that's then suffered quite considerably. So what they what they want to do is sort of take the best of both worlds and then utilize more technology to develop fire that bit more. Um, it's kind of exciting. You know, it's difficult to say how it's going to develop, and if in two years' time we won't be talking about something else at HL seven. Um, it really hinges on the implementers. It hinges on it hinges on the actual hospitals themselves to uh, to use this technology. That therein lies a challenge. You're right. Most of them still use two. So, so myself, as, as a developer, if I come to my uh, S customers and they have a, a need to exchange data between their system and yet unknown system, mm. do I say let's use V2 because I can craft a message out of that? Do I do V3 because V3 is much more open and it allows me to be to do a much more uh, ad hoc message for my need. Mm -hmm. Do I say, oh, let's go FHIR and figure out if we can find somebody who can implement the other end of the FHIR? Well, I think uh, the thing with, I mean, FHIR doesn't give you the kind of, the, as much flexibility as version three does. Version three gives you a bit more flexibility. Uh, FHIR doesn't, it kind of goes back to the roots of version two and that I will give you, I'm defining the method, defining kind of the, the clinical processes. And you have worked with those clinical processes just as version two does. So it's kind of going, getting away from from three's ability to give you lots of great things and then craft your own, which is a good thing and a bad thing. And it's kind of what HL71 is used to do is to keep things to a standard way, to exchange the information in a standard way using standard protocols and processes and not get, and not get, get away from that. But 
but do it in a semantic way as well. So they want the semantics of version three. So I want to be able to say uh, put the this bit of information to this bit of information is is the, uh, one and the same. It doesn't change, but it's nice and rich for meta. Not like version two, which is kind of a bit verbose. It's difficult to read, difficult to change. Mm -hmm. A more formal but a better defined uh, object model, less flexible than this three, but m more easily accessible because it's rest and more like yes. could get delayed. Yes. So now, if I'm a, a, a health application provider, I'm, I'm writing an app. I'm trying to figure out some way to expose some patient information. FHIR doesn't give me the flexibility to say I want that part of the data model plus extra information that are the unique selling point to my application. If it doesn't support it, no. So I would have to go back to uh, version 3 to say, give me that core data plus that extra data. It, yeah, you would, you're right. Uh, you would have to go back to version 3 to give that kind of flexibility, but uh, the difficulty you've got there was kind of what you're tying yourself into. Because you, you could potentially have, I want this bit of information, but then what does that bit of information mean to anything else in the system? Does, so, it, does it have a meaning or doesn't so it? FHIR is more like system to system, a, a more like dynamic, a much more uh, formalized way of talking as opposed to as a bunch of data trying to interpret what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, yeah, if it's a put, I'm creating something. If it's a get, I'm getting something. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what, that's what it, virus, that's what it is right now. And it's international? Is this take up to it? Um, the standard is so new. It's the standard so new. The take up is the take up is kind of uh, in its infancy at the minute. Um, so it's not develop. It's still developing. I would say it will be international. It's HL7 standard. It's, it's been developed by an HL7 working group. So it's, the standard will be uh, will be growing. Um, it's you know it's kind of it is quite exciting because it's kind of built on modern technology and does does overcome. You lose some things, but you gain some things. You know, it's, it's they're being built on modern technology. I think it facilitates, as as the lady there mentioned, it does facilitate all the, all the uses of that information. And then that's kind of what HL7 are really thinking about is how, in terms of kind of exchanging this information and the development of modern technology, the exchange is quite great. I think it's kind of it's quite relevant actually to the next talk that's coming uh, about exchanging patient records, um, exchanging patient information your own patient information. Um, it's kind of relevant because you know the, the NHS and most healthcare providers want to open up this information if they want it to be shared more openly. But again, and again I'm talking about stuff I don't know much, but what I've read, it is two layers to it.